With a central population of 40,000 and an urbanized population of 120,000, Hagerstown, Maryland ranks as one of the fastest growing regions in the country. In the past few decades, the largely blue-collar workforce has transformed into a diverse and modern business community. The Hagerstown Fire Department has transformed as well. Like many fire departments across the country, Hagerstown has established institutional community risk reduction as a core value within its organization. The path to this fundamental change in its culture wasn't easy, and there's a lot to be learned from the mistakes that were made. Hagerstown's story begins with a catalyst, a young firefighter who had the right idea, but didn't have a proper plan or the support of his department. I've known Mike Weller for well over 20 years, and I think he exhibits what we see in a lot of folks that we would put in that catalyst category. That spark plug, that person in the organization that's going to be the champion for community risk reduction. And we talk about community risk reduction, we're talking about fire prevention, we're talking about preventable injuries, we're talking about nat natural disasters. So there needs to be a person in the organization that's going to spearhead this. Uh, I think without a question, we have to look at Mike Weller as being that catalyst. I have been fortunate to have lived through an entire cultural evolution in community risk reduction in the city of Hagerstown. When I joined the department in 1981, we did a small amount of prevention. Um, we steadily grew through the years, and now to see that prevention gets an entire week or community risk reduction gets an entire week of attention in our new recruit training academy. Uh, our new firefighters, it, it is just part of their culture that every day we are going to do something on risk reduction. All I ever wanted to do was become a firefighter. From the time I was four years old, my parents put me on the first rig, and I joined the service in 1974 as a volunteer. I tried for several years to become a career firefighter, and I, I could not make the cut in the metropolitan areas because of my poor eyesight. Fortunately, after three tries, I was hired on by Hagerstown in 1981. I started in October of 1981. First initial impression of Mike, typical new hire, like we all was one time, full of all kinds of ideas, excitement, just raring to go. It was such a great feeling to be able to come in and get paid to do something that you just love doing, but I became very bored with just sitting in a firehouse about a year after I came to work. Times were different back then. Pay wasn't as good, and in order to augment our pay, we had part-time jobs. And when we came to work, we expected to relax and not have to be out on the street providing there wasn't a fire. We were more a reactionary fire department than a prevention-oriented department. The volunteers, uh, we were a combination department, the volunteers organized a community-wide survey whereby we career firefighters took the volunteers out on the rig and they were searching for data about how many homes had smoke alarms and other baseline information. And I was just struck by the fact that the career staff sat in the fire rigs and the volunteer staff did the work. And I just thought, well, why can't we as a department get going on a smoke alarm program? And we had one at the volunteer house where I belonged. And so that's where the idea really originated from. After reviewing the results of the volunteer survey, Mike realized there was a real need for a smoke alarm program in Hagerstown. Less than 50% of the homes in our city in 1981 had smoke alarm protection. And it led me to go to the former fire chief, who was very receptive about considering the possibility of starting a smoke alarm program where we gave them away, so long as it didn't cost the department any money. 
We published the number in the local newspaper. We had it on television. And in November of 1983, our department started to give away free smoke alarms. Mike began to voluntarily spend time working on prevention out of the Hagerstown Fire Marshal's office. When the Hagerstown Fire Chief retired, Mike found an unexpected ally in the new chief, Gary Hawbaker. I was one of the first people that Chief Hallbaker interviewed when he was hired in 1985. He took the time to speak face to face with everyone and true to Mike form, uh, he introduced himself. I was in the Fire Prevention Bureau that evening when he walked in and he asked me, well, what are we doing in fire prevention? I heard you were on fire for the topic and do you have any ideas? And so we had a nice long chat. My, you're always, when you come into the department new, you're always looking for that energy. And uh, Mike definitely had that energy I was looking for. I had this vision of, hey chief, let's, let's for the right thing to do, let's go out and go to every house in our city and see if they have a working smoke alarm and if they need something, we'll put it in for them. His approval of going door to door with that smoke alarm program I felt validated as a firefighter, I felt important, and more than anything, I was just elated that we, the Hagerstown Fire Department, were going to go out and do the right things for people in the community. And I, I just assumed that all firefighters would be very enthusiastic about that because inevitably we would be saving lives. This whole program started out as a voluntary program, and then after it was sold to the new fire chief, uh, he said, they work for me and they'll go out when I tell them to go out and that's the way it's gonna be. Well, that created friction for Mike. Mike uh, took it upon himself to start this program. He went to the fire chief and got permission and didn't consult with his fellow firefighters and went full speed ahead, totally out of control. And I knew there would be some resistance, uh, but it seemed like the right thing to do. We knew that we had a community that was 60% renters. We knew we had a fire problem. We knew we had people dying. And if we weren't reaching them the way we wanted to with conventional media, newspapers, TVs. And so the best thing was to go to their door, be there with it and say, we're here to help you. I did not have the insight to think about our organization's culture, organizational determinants. I was a 22-year-old young person full of enthusiasm, drive, and from my heart, let's just go out and do the right things for the community. I never gave it a thought what my peers would think. A lot of reasons they was upset. Number one, Mike had minimum years of service out in the field with the guys in the suppression field. Uh, they didn't feel that he proved himself to a lot of them. They didn't know him. They didn't know how good of a firefighter he was, and he wasn't accepted yet as a firefighter. Uh, and then all of a sudden he comes around this fire prevention program, this new kid on the block, and then he's going to give orders and be our boss. It caused a lot of friction, a lot of friction. We thought we would humor Mike, and we would let him, he would have free reign for a while, and. After a year or so, things would come crashing down and we would could go back to the status quo. After the chief approved going door to door citywide, when we were in the planning stages, I, it never occurred to me to look to see how many homes we were going to go to in one year. And that number turned out being 12,000. And I clearly remember the chief saying to me, how long do you think this will take us? And I said, oh, Chief, it's probably just a couple of months. And my God. I mean, the guys were on the streets for months. And rightfully so. They were, you know, they were upset. It was a total disaster. A three-month program was supposed to have all the support of volunteers and help to go door to door in the city of Hagerstown. Went from three months, started in June, and we was clean into November and it's dark outside, we're walking down dark streets and uniforms with badges on and you knock on a door and they say, the cops are outside, you know, and it just wasn't comfortable feeling, plus it went forever. You just, the friction, and everybody just wanted to string Mike up after that. How could you possibly do this to us? You're 
you're, you're wronging a brother firefighter. To other firefighters gave me the silent treatment. Um, they, they didn't say very much. When Mike wanted this program, they, they should have sat back and reevaluated it and said, maybe we ought to get some of the senior guys from each shift and sit down and get some input because Mike has to sell it to the senior people first because if the senior people balk at it, the junior members are going to follow what the senior people want to do. And that's where the problem was. No communication, so the friction was, and it just, just boiled up to a volcanic eruption there you know, early on in the program. Although Hagerstown's firefighters overwhelmingly disapproved of Mike's methods, a local tragedy made everyone aware that the smoke alarm program had real value. We did our first citywide canvas in the spring of 1986. During that canvas, at the time, our first one, what we were doing, we were going door to door, just like we had done in 1981, and we were logging if people did not have, or whether they did or they did not have a smoke alarm present. And then what we would do was we would go back, we would make an appointment and come back and reinstall the alarms. And I, I will never, never forget this, nor were our staff. We had gone to a home that had three children. We knew that they did not have smoke alarms and we wanted to make an appointment to come back and it had been convenient a couple of times and then we couldn't catch them home. And unfortunately, during that time period, they had a fire and all three children died in that fire. Got up at five o'clock in the morning, left for work. Seven o'clock to convince when my house was on fire. My wife was out the hospital and knew enough about the kids. I went out the hospital and she was burnt really bad. And I asked one of the kids where they said they didn't know. I left the hospital, went back over to the house, and found out the kids were dead. And that was a that was a landmark decision for us that from that day forward on. What we would do is we would be uh, an instant point of service where we would, if we found out there was a deficiency, we would take care of it right then and there. The need for community risk reduction in Hagerstown was real. Mike and Chief Hawbaker realized mistakes had been made, but continued to move forward. One of the very early things that Chief Hallbaker did was he pitched the idea of creating a full-time prevention position to council. And it took him through the political process about almost, I guess, three years um, to have that position come to fruition. And amazingly enough, no one else applied for it. One of the things that Chief Hallbaker would recognize is he had this tremendous talent in Mike Weller. But what he really needed to do was to be able to rein it in. And so Chief Hallbaker thought that it would be best for Mike to come over to the National Fire Academy and to take some classes. I learned at the National Fire Academy how to lead a risk reduction process. And I came back from that experience armed with a brand new plan. I went out and I spoke with everyone and I sincerely apologized. And I, I've done that many times, I've had to through the years. And I told them, look, I'm very sorry for my initial arrogance and for my lack of insight. And I asked them, I said, what are my shortcomings? They said, well, one is certainly you need to talk to us. And if you want us to do something, we need to understand why do you want us to do something and what's in it for us. What is this going to do? Is it going to reduce incidents? Is it going to get us more staffing? Are we going to get more salary? How can we use it as a, a political leveraging tool? And they were right. If there's no free ride, there's got to be something in this for everyone. The catalyst for community risk reduction has to have insight into the organization. They really have to understand all the dynamics that are taking place in that organization. And if you're a new person coming in, you may not fully understand what that culture is in your organization. Mike realized that institutional support from his fellow firefighters was a battle that he couldn't win through the chief's office. The place where hearts and minds needed to be won was where his fellow firefighters were freely talking about his programs. Uh, the kitchen is where the coffee served, and at shift change, you have 
five or six guys coming on, same amount going off duty. You meet here, you share ideas, you criticize, you tell stories, you solve all the world's problems. Things are accomplished at this table. What you need to do is to look around your organization and who are those formal and informal leaders. It may be your union president, it may be a person who's been in the department a long time who's highly regarded. And so what you need to do is to find those folks and explain to them what you're trying to do. And to get their support, you have to talk to people, you have to listen to what people are saying. And, and the firefighters you know, on the shift sat there and told Mike like it was. You know. Yeah, number one, you you, know, you got to be out there with us, Mike. If you're not helping us, you know, you're not showing that you know you're going to be a part of this program, and just go set up behind the desk. You know better than our fire chief. The next time around, Mike's out there right with us. He's hanging that smoke alarm. He's collecting the papers when we're done. He's staying up late at night, you know, compiling all this information, and he proved that you know he really wanted this program to work because it took it from the, you know, the man at the top, the leader, and that's what position he was in. He was supposed to lead the firefighters hanging these smoke alarms. He finally developed into a leader and showed he cared, and he cared about you know, the firefighters out in the field, and that made a big difference. Once Hagerstown embraced a process of community risk reduction, and over time started to see tangible results, and that those results have been reduction in deaths, reduction in injuries, reduction in property loss, less responses, the firefighters really understood why their work was important in the community. I think the guys did it enough and they seen that the program was working and seen, you know, what the rewards was, that then they started, you know, going out, you know, and didn't mind doing it. They, in fact, they enjoyed going out a lot of them. Uh, and that was the big thing there again was the communication and the public support, you know, and all the support we got from the public, the publicity, you know, and actually, the program actually worked and saved a lot of lives in the city. It made our job easier in the suppression field because it made the public aware of fire safety. I think those failures made us stronger. I think they made us realize where our weaknesses were and the things we could do better. So, you know, don't expect to walk into a project and expect it to go all right. And if it doesn't go right, just go, hell with it, that's it. I'm not even going to try it. You know, it can be fixed if you want to fix it. With the support of both his chief and fellow firefighters, Mike's smoke alarm program became an accepted function of the Hagerstown Fire Department. Right after that is the survey. Please fill this out for every house. You what I do here is I run the smoke alarm program. It's called SAFE, Smoke Alarms for Everyone, and we install smoke alarms for residents in the city of Hagerstown who need smoke alarms or need upgrading of smoke alarms that are 10 years or older. One of the things firefighters suggested was stop the heresy of going to, it ended up being a couple years later up to 14,000 houses per year. They said if you keep trying to do this we're going to take you out. Let's figure a way that we can make this more palatable. So the magic number became 4,000. Every May, we do half of our downtown zone every year because that's where our greatest frequency of incidents happens. And then in addition to that, two census tracts. They're not very excited about going out. This is not their favorite thing to do, obviously. Um, once we get them out in the community, they actually really enjoy it. It gives them an outreach to the people. I think that once they start talking to the people, they realize how important prevention is. What we're trying to show here is that these are skills, and just like we learn how to tie knots and ropes, that this is just another skill, and that we really need to help them develop that confidence to go out in the community and do good work. This is the example of when we finish surveys at the end of the night, it actually makes us feel very good because this was what we would consider a high risk location. Uh, an individual in his 60s, smoker, uh, you know, high risk based on his, uh, his use of prescription medications for uh, his pain therapy. This would not be a reliable smoke alarm in the event that uh, he would have an incident in his, in his home. So uh, again, we feel very, very good about taking that out tonight and replacing it with a very reliable smoke alarm uh, that we can count on. That, that I think really hit home the most are when we see uh, kids or uh, the elderly that are in a, in a tough situation and, uh, and, and you know, we respond by you know, 
trying to do the best we can, educating them in the short time that we have you know, you know, with them right there in their home. It's a fulfillment to the community that I work, work in and serve. Uh, a lot of the homes that we go into, the residents sometimes are trying to give us donations, you know, like the typical volunteer fire department, you know, thank you for your time, here's a donation for your services. And it's a great opportunity for us to be able to go into our neighborhoods and, and show them that the taxes that they're paying for in, in the city is providing them a service. We advertise in several different ways. Um, TV, we do commercials, although those are pretty expensive. Um, billboards, we found billboards have been a really big help to us because um, a lot of people see them and a lot of people are driving, you sit at a red light, you're going to look around and see them. Um, we advertise on radio. We do se several different um, radio stations, one geared towards older adult, which has been great for us. Um, then we'll do a radio station that has a little bit of new newer music to reach a different population. Um, we also advertise in church bulletins and um, when we do our outreach in schools we send home a letter with the kids for them to call us if they need smoke detectors to their parents and we also um, advertise by word of mouth. Once you start the program you know they're gonna tell their friends, their family and we get a lot of phone calls through that. Working smoke alarms save lives. Hello everyone, this is Mike Weller. Mike You're even takes the time to work a weekly Texas shift as a DJ right on the local now, radio station, personally reaching out to the community about prevention. Free lithium smoke alarms that have batteries that last 10 years. I was years. listening to my radio, WJEJ, which is our local station, and I heard Mike Weller, who was one of the announcers, or he was talking at the time and saying that we could come to your house, install smoke alarms that would last for 10 years. So I decided, well, this is an opportunity. I called the station and Mike told me to call Megan, his partner, and I called her and it wasn't but two days later that they came by and installed a smoke alarm in my hallway and one out in my back room. It's a wonderful thing that the fire department We'll come to your house and install a smoke alarm to help them as well as us so that if we have a fire, they can get there faster. One of the biggest things you can do for community out outreach is make community partners. Um, these partners can do health fairs. They do all kinds of events that you can be invited to. There you can do fire prevention. You can talk to families about how to prevent fires. You can also get signups for smoke alarm installations. Um, usually the population that are at these events are, need our services and it's a great venue to reach a lot of people for free. Also through those community partners you can get referrals to homes like the Commission on Aging. A lot of older people are, don't really trust people that they don't know to come into their homes but if they hear about it from these agencies that they know and trust and refer them to us they're more likely to let us come into their home. With the institutional and community equity Mike and Chief Hawbaker were building, they saw an opportunity to start Children's Village, a program that would reach into every home with school-aged children in the county. This is our annual Kids Alive Fest at Children's Safety Village. We open the uh, facility once a year to the entire community, so everyone gets the opportunity to experience the life-saving educational activities that happen at this nonprofit center. Okay, you yeah. have. A fire evacuation plan in your family? Okay. Y'all yeah, have a meeting place? Place to meet? Right okay. by the tree. Okay, by the tree? Okay, what do you do when the fire department arrives? Children's Safety Village is a five acre injury prevention campus. It was built by and for our community. The idea was actually brought to us in 1985 by the local telephone company. They took it to the Maryland State Police. The state police then brought together a coalition of stakeholders and we decided to set out on a mission to build an injury prevention center that would serve our grade two population. It took us about five years to secure the land free of charge from the Board of Education and then our local builders and contractors worked together and they collectively donated all of the building materials and the labor to uh, build the initial phases of this project. At Safety Village, second graders receive a two-day comprehensive injury prevention curriculum. 
Uh, one day features uh, exclusively on fire safety. Uh, the next day focuses on overall injury prevention to include traffic, pedestrian, bike, and water safety. And over the years, I think Local 1605 has donated, I think, over $70,000 to Children's Village. That is a shining example of institutionalized support. Our fire department began using burn homes as neighborhood classrooms in 1988. And this home that we're in was relocated by the firefighters to Children's Safety Village. The concept is if we have a fire in a neighborhood and it is a significant fire, we will ask the occupant of the home and the owner if we can come in a week or so after the fire and invite the neighborhood and allow them to come in for a very structured interactive tour. This house is a home that we used for one of those neighborhood tours. After the tour was over, the property owner was trying to decide, well, what do we do with this house? Could you take it maybe to the fire department and burn it up for training? And that's when our firefighters collectively decided, no, no, no. We have a permanent home for this. Let's take it to Children's Safety Village. We sat there for a couple of minutes and we talked about, well, could we really move a burned down house clear across town? And, you know, my, my colleagues um, from the fire department looked at me and said, Mikey, we're firefighters. We can do anything. Well, members of the, of the Hagerstown Fire Department uh, jumped in to help and we had to dig a foundation, we had to brick, we had to set the house, we had to brick case the house. Uh, so we blend in with the neighborhood and not have a controversy there. And everybody jumped in and that's how, that's how it got done. One of the ways that you can be successful in prevention and getting buy-in from your firefighters is ask them what they would like to do to contribute. So have them tell you, instead of just automatically assigning duties to people that may not be a good fit for them, show them what you're about, what you're trying to achieve, and what's a way that they feel that they can contribute best. So the big thing is just ask. The dollhouse was built by one of our station firefighters who really didn't have an interest in teaching the second graders per se, but wanted to make a contribution to the overall cause of Children's Village. And he and his colleagues um, built this dollhouse over a period of several months. We can pipe smoke in from a smoke machine that's located in its basement, and it really reinforces the concept of why you need working smoke alarms on all levels of the home and why you need to have a prearranged family escape plan. We have about $600 uh, in materials invested into the dollhouse. The uh, labor was all free, and overall its worth and the value of our curriculum and our impact of the curriculum is priceless. I am just so in all of them that they have always had the can-do attitude, from moving a burned home, to helping to build the center, to building all the educational props. They've never said, we can't do this, it's always, what do you want, where do you want it, and just get out of our way. Mike was able to demonstrate that Children's Village had tangible results. A shining example of the outcome that's been produced by Children's Safety Village is nine-year-old Tanner Shoemaker. Uh, Tanner, a uh, year ago, attended our program, and because of what he learned at Children's Safety Village, he was able to help save his mom's life. Mom had a medical emergency at home and she fell face first down a flight of stairs and dad was uh, kind of frantic at the time and Tanner took the situation very calmly. Um, he went to the telephone, summoned emergency assist assistance, helped perform em emergency medical dispatch instructions and his mom is alive today. My mom blacked out and fell down 13 stairs. I called 911 and then the 911 center told me the instructions. Then I did what they said. I learned how to do what I did at Children's Village. And that's about as strong as proof as you can get that you have people walking and talking as a direct result of the resources that you put in on the front end to prevention. Where you read or you hear where, not only here in Hagerstown, but in Washington County, where the young child, you know, made a life-saving call by calling 911 or remembering to drop, stop, drop, and roll, you know, 
uh, we do it every year. You know, we actually honor these children in this county for that. This is a House of Delegates resolution. House resolution be it hereby known to all that the House of Delegates of Maryland offers its sincerest congratulations to Dylan Durbaro in recognition of your life-saving action and recognizing a life-threatening situation which has now earned you the induction into the Children's Village Life Safety Hall of Fame. While statistics showed Hagerstown's programs were having a real impact, the firefighters saw how they were having an effect in their everyday interactions with the community. And that's where the rewards is. They're just the average person coming up off the street and thanking us, you know, for doing a nice demonstration or, you know, they remember. And that's where it always is, you know, your PR and the people remember and they respect the firefighters. Unfortunately, we have a culture that is so much response oriented and we really need to kind of take a step back and recognize that we're on the same team, that we have prevention, but we also have an important role in suppression. But far too often in the fire service, we really focus on what I would call the event stage. So most of our training is really directed at what we do during the event. And I would just like folks to pull back a little bit and look at all that time before the event, the pre-event stage, the prevention stage, and all the things that can be done to help prevent and mitigate some of these terrible things that happen in our community. And, and a key to a lot of it is, is the newer generation of firefighters coming in, that they're already better educated and understanding on fire prevention. You know, a lot of them's taken here you know, in high school, even locally owned schools, when they come aboard, they think more of fire prevention. Everybody wants to go out and fight a fire, but in the back of their head, I mean, they're all for going out and knowing what fire prevention can do. I love doing fire prevention. I mean, there's nothing better than helping the community, and ultimately, it helps us as firefighters. Oh, absolutely. These are my neighbors, you know. I want to make sure that I go out here to, to take care of them, and to take care of them, I have to keep them from getting hurt. And when I go to their house, you know, I at least want them out. You get to see the benefits uh, whenever you go out and you have a fire that's detected early uh, and we have our, our early response and you know that that makes a difference. It reduces loss, property, and also potentially life. So that's when you know that, that you're actually making a difference. I have been a supporter of fire prevention for several reasons. One, because it works. We have the statistics to prove that and it's the right thing to do and we're very proud of our efforts and our success. If you don't have a good fire prevention program people are going to more people are going to die get injured more property is going to burn down and that's where Hagerstown is ranking up there amongst the top as far as fire prevention because you look at our dollar loss and our you know our injury and life loss in this city is low. The numbers prove that Hagerstown's community risk reduction programs are working. Our community of about 40,000 people, it's a blue collar community, 60% renters. We had 14 fires of estimated damage of over $5,000. And I always tell my officers they estimate fire loss too high, but uh, that's an amazing figure. Out of 2,000 incidents a year, we had 14 that were, quote, serious fire damage. And I don't know what else you can attribute that to, other than the efforts of this department and the support of our councils. You know, obviously, we can say we want to do things, and we can do a lot, but it takes the support of your community and your politicians. You know, we brag uh, about the decrease in fires in our city. Our fire prevention people have done such a fantastic job. Uh, they go into the communities on a regular basis. Uh, we do uh, smoke alarm checks. Uh, you know, people welcome us into their house. We have one of the fastest response times in the nation. We have great qualified firefighters and a great department. I think for me, as I look back in 25 years, I think it's 
been what we've accomplished as a department. And it just isn't the education part. You know, the code enforcement part is so important. And I'm just so glad we have our own fire marshal's office that, that is looking out for the firefighters when they look at building plans, when they look at how communities are going to be uh, constructed with roads and so forth. The investigation part, fire investigation. Uh, you know, we, we have quite a high rate of uh, arrest when it comes to arson, somewhere around 70%, which is extraordinary in this country. And then you have the buy-in of the firefighters that finally decide, you know what? Going out on that street for two hours each night, during nice weather, uh, isn't only helping our community, but it's helping us. You know, firefighter safety is so important today. Well, what better safety is than to never leave that fire station? You know, does it get any better than that? So when you talk to me about safety, you better talk prevention. There's a lot to learn from Hagerstown's example. One of the most important lessons is where to begin. Fire chiefs across this nation, I think are really looking for reasons to do community risk reduction. But what we need to show them is why we need to be doing it. City managers, council members, mayors, they all understand about numbers. And so if we can provide for them the, the data that supports why it's important by identifying what those leading risks are in our community, then that certainly goes a long way with convincing fire chiefs across this nation that we need to take action and we can't just sit back and wait to be called. If a department is just getting started in prevention, the absolute foundation is to learn where you are right now. You have to identify your local risks, the sequence that's leading to those risks. That will naturally move into prioritizing what your risks are based on frequency of occurrence, how many people are getting hurt or being killed, um, what it's costing, and you can identify then the resources that you will need to get the job done. Another lesson is that the support of the chief is not enough for these programs to succeed. Chief has, has put the brakes on me so many times and he said, you know, Mike, you can see the goal line, you're running with the ball, but you forget that there's a whole other team of people with you. And I think if I could make any recommendation to someone coming up into the field of prevention, communication and understanding organizational culture and determinants are essential. If you don't have the support of the team, you are going to flounder. Building organizational equity takes time, it takes patience, it takes commitment. That's probably one of the biggest things that separates us from people in suppression. They're used to that immediate gratification. They go on a call and within a few minutes, a few hours, it's really taken care of itself and there's an outcome. But when you're involved in prevention, you are in it for the long haul. And it may take you years to see the difference in your community. So with proper planning, with good organizational support, with building that community equity, you can achieve these things, but it's gonna happen over time. The National Fire Academy has taught me and continues to teach our firefighters the tried and true process of how to orchestrate successful community risk reduction for an entire community. And I can say after 29 years in Hagerstown that we have an incredible amount of outreach, impact, and now tangible outcome to show that we have followed that process taught by the National Fire Academy. We can't afford to lose people and property to events that are predictable, preventable, and understandable. So I think what prevention does is it really does give you and your organization a good feeling 
they're really out there making a difference day in and day out, and it can affect the culture of the fire service. It affected the culture of the Hagerstown Fire Department, and it's evident in everything they do that the safety of the community comes first, and when the community's safe, the firefighters are safe. Thank you.